Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to review Succession Season 4, Episode 3, Connor's Wedding, directed by Mark Malloyd and written by Jesse Armstrong. I was trying to think of a funny name to relate it to the Red Wedding or the Purple Wedding. What wedding would this be? I just think it's fucking hilarious that... (laughs) Anytime, like, we think back to this episode, like, arguably one of the best episodes of the series, if not, like, TV, it's, the name of it is Connor's Wedding. <laughs> right, yeah, no, I guess that's perfect. It will just be Connor's Wedding. Go, oh, man, that episode when Logan died, uh, what episode was that? Uh, it was during Connor's Wedding. Oh, yeah, Connor's, Connor's Wedding. Connor's Wedding, yeah. Made it easy for us. Perfect. Yeah. It's funny, it's one last fuck you from Logan to Connor, right? Upstaging his eldest son, who he never cared about. I'm just going to die on your wedding. And for Connor, it almost felt personal, right? He's like, well, let's just go through with it, right? He ends up marrying Willa there at the end, but... That's the- actually nice. Right? <laughs> yeah, and even the conversation that they had. <laughs> we're over here focusing on Connor and Willa. <laughs> but yeah, this was a, an absolute shocker. I think we're 10 minutes in when they get the phone call that something's happening with Logan. And the way Tom, the entire episode, or that t- entire interaction was trying to spin his own death talking them down like yeah he's uh, his heart was working just a minute ago but it stopped now <laughs> so he, even then when logan's on death's door he can't give them a clear answer but i mean to put it mildly it, it was a shocker and this is what the show has done so well is that they subvert your expectations and they give you those doses of reality that make the show feel so real and this was heartbreaking to watch i mean all the trauma all the pain that logan has caused them all of it being mustered up in those moments. It's been simmering for three seasons, and to have it come to this type of conclusion, it is so devastating because of how real it is. And I think the show creator, Jesse Armstrong, said they wanted to capture the way that people have to grapple with death in the modern world, where it can be over a phone call or over an email, you know, the digital barriers that we have now created, you know, how information can sometimes get lost when you're trying to communicate through, you know, phone or text or whatever it is. So it, it was hard to watch. And and arguably their best episode ever. Yeah, I think what stood out to me was like the authenticity when it came to uh, these characters dealing with the situation here. Almost any movie, any show, uh, someone gets a call about someone dies. They have a little reaction, a cut, and then maybe you're at a funeral or something. This was like real time of them trying to process their grief and what to do next. It really impressed me the way they were talking about how they approach filming the sequence, basically doing it all in succession, like back to back to back, keeping almost these super long takes. And they were sitting around film around the set so they can quickly shift and didn't have to worry about reloading the camera and stuff like that. And I think that really resonates like when you watch these scenes because it is just so real, so fast moving. And it, it, it's something that I think this show has always done well, but I think it really shined here. Yeah. And I think, as you mentioned, the technical wizardry that was on display, their intention was to make it feel like a play. And you sort of that raw emotion comes through the screen that you sense when you are watching a play because it's only one take. Right. And that's sort of how it felt like these were the one takes that these characters were giving and and their performances were so devastating and so raw and so emotional. Obviously, you know, the stuttering, the stammering, the denial, especially with a character like Roman, the disbelief with Kendall. I mean, Jeremy Strong is a fantastic actor. So when he has to act <laughs> in disbelief, he's got the perfect face for it. And of course, with uh, Sarah Snook as Siobhan, all of those emotions, the, those it's amazing because Logan is such a larger than life presence. So even when you get that call and you've been grappling with this information for five, ten minutes, you still feel like he's not dead. Mm-hmm. And, and it does speak to his personality and his presence in the show. But that's that real sensation you feel when you get that call that a loved one has passed away, that it can't be real, that right. they were just here. And a line that always stuck with me when thinking about Logan Roy is a line from The Godfather Part 2 when Michael Corleone says that Hyman Roth thinks he's going to live forever. He's this aging gangster. He's kept a tight grip on his empire, but nothing lasts forever. And I think with Logan Roy, it was intentional that he never prepared his kids for his death or really molded them into actual successors because, one, he thought he was going to live forever, and two... That was just sort of the point of his character is that nobody can do what I do. So now, you know, we're going to see the the lack of preparation that these characters have to to deal with his absence. Yeah. And for, you know, for the character of Logan Roy specifically 
to die this way, it, it just feels very appropriate. You know, the, the old saying is we're born, al- we come into this world alone and then we die alone. Well, for, in Logan's case, it, it's it's almost worse than being alone, right? You're, you're surrounded by the parasites who are ready to get the ball moving in terms of what comes next and what type of power plays they're going to make. And his dead body is just lying there on the floor. So for, for all the despicable things he's done, you can argue that this was a death that he deserved. No forgiveness, no resolution. It's a little too late for all that. You only have your estranged children talking to your unconscious body through a telephone, unable to clearly express their love for you because of all the pain and anguish that you've put them through. As I said, it's an unceremonial death that is fitting for this type of character. And for these characters to have to end that relationship off, you know, Roman, the last thing he said to him was leaving him that voicemail, and he doesn't know if Logan even heard it, where he's, he's questioning his loyalty once again, saying, are you fucking me around? And same thing with Kendall and Shiv, you know, the last interaction they have was Logan opening up to them and them slamming the door. So just adds so many elements of heartbreak. Yeah, it is fitting that everyone was always looking forward to where do these two parties, like the kids and their father, how do they either reconcile or fully just separate and we never really get to see that play out because logan's dead now right yeah reality just gets yeah. in the way it's he's an 84 year old man he's <laughs> super busy he's had health problems this could happen just like that he's gone he's off of the chessboard and now you start to think okay what position do the roy children find themselves in because of all the All the shit that they've gone through with their dad, all the back and forths and the battles of them trying to kill him and him trying to kill them, now he's gone. So at the very least, he was their shield. Now everybody in the company is going to be coming for that top spot. They can't fall back on daddy. They have to fend for themselves. So I think that starts to creep in, uh, well, it definitely starts to creep in towards the end when they realize, okay, our father's gone, we have to mourn. But what's next? What's the next move? Because if we are late to the start, we're going to get lapped here. No, the balancing act of having to grieve your dead father and also have to think about things like even Shiv being like, can we let them stay up in the air for an extra couple of minutes? (laughs) Like just again. that's why it was so brilliant because yeah. even though it was devastating it was still hilarious it yeah. was still succession no cause this is just how this like they operate like <laughs> they can't do anything without relating it to how it affects them like financially or with the larger in, in the larger picture with waystar royco <laughs> like that's one of the things that i feel like in the beginning people are hesitant to bring up but like once i think once carolina kind of brings up like uh hey should we like start to maybe think of uh what we should do <laughs> when we land like once that happens like the floodgates open then they start every other character kind of slowly begins to realize oh yeah like we have other shit we have to deal with now we can't fully focus on what just happened with logan yeah they get that news that they're preparing a statement and <laughs> they realize oh the game is afoot we have to get back <laughs> yeah we have to put on it's... our game faces and start crafting our own statement it's so ridiculous and L- roman like at, again seems to be like the only human one i love when he it was funny with him trying to show affection especially towards connor like when they first tell him that was like i think that was one of the sadder moments because when the first when the kids are first reacting i think as the audience you kind of have that same reaction they are like this isn't real like oh he's gonna something's gonna happen where all right he's, he's breathing again you know they're not gonna kill logan off screen and just say he's dead now like that's ridiculous or this was him faking it right because yeah, he or, would do that shit right or something but did like, you miss me kids but when they like bring connor into the fold and he has his reactions like well he never really loved me anyway like that's when i was like starting to really feel sad for everyone and even roman like his little attempt to like hug and console connor time and time again i feel like he's the one who i used to think was the most removed but he seems like he still has the most humanity out of any of the characters and even when he like it hurts him in the beginning of the episode when he has to tell jerry that they're gonna fire her yeah and the way he ends off as i mentioned leaving him that voicemail and then being in denial the entire episode which was half heartbreaking half hilarious because when the rest of the group on the plane offers their condolences and Roman's like, ugh, you know, he's still holding out that his father is alive. Sorry for your loss. Yeah. And it's so funny when Kendall's got his assistant on the line. We need the best plane doctor. We need the best heart doctor. And get the best heart doctor in the world and the best airplane medicine expert in the world. You know, we'd have fly them up there on a jetpack and shit. So these kids, they've been so spoiled. They've been handled, handed everything their entire lives. They truly believe in these moments that they could save their father, that they can beat death. And it it speaks to the disbelief that you feel when you're in mourning, uh, the helplessness 
but also the hubris and the arrogance that comes with being a member of the Roy family. You know, reality does eventually set in. And I, I imagine a lot of people will watch this and think, man, these kids, you know, they've been trying to get back at their father for so long, and now all these confessions of love. And But that's, uh, I think that's natural. That's what you see in the real world when you have this abusive relationship with a parent that you still love them no matter yeah. what they've done. And that makes it more heartbreaking. You probably even love them more. You can argue maybe Roman's been the most abused, I guess, when you factor in the, the actual physical abuse. It, it almost feels like Stockholm Syndrome a bit coming from Roman. And oh, that's why, so. it, yeah, it's just all around. It, it just makes it, it made it hard to watch. I, I was went to, I, I was cringing in my seat watching these characters go through this. I felt so, so bad for them, more so than I ever have in this show, which is saying so much because of just how despicable that man was. And even though he's one of my favorite characters on the show, but it, no, like, it's no just one, amazing that they were able to pull this reaction out of me and, and also the characters. Like, no one deserved death more than he did. <laughs> and it's so telegraphed now looking back, right? All the conversations that he was having and the things that he was saying and planning for the future. I'm going to be in here and definitely in the newsroom and we're going to totally reshape this. And then, But nope. you don't think it happens like episode three. Like I was completely yeah. shocked. Did it on fucking Easter too. But you, Jesus I, came was... back, but what did it cost? <laughs> we can't know. But I've got my suspicions. It was always in the back of my mind, like, how this guy is so intense, one of these days is just going to catch up to him. But then I remember so many of these old financial moguls, they live until they're like 98. So I'm like, no, this guy's got two decades left in him. He's going, he is the old bull. And then, no, you know, wrong place, wrong time. And you still are holding out. It's like the end of, uh, it is literally like Jon Snow. Like, oh, is there Melisandre around? Is there a red priestess that can do her voodoo <laughs> Sweden's got some interesting tech maybe I don't know maybe Madsen could bring him back yeah they should have kept going right yeah see what that tech whiz is up to but yeah I, I mean to kill off such a, a powerhouse of a character and Brian Cox we've been so complimentary of him as, as an actor in this show to kill him off with seven episodes left talk about a risk because as great as this episode was we're gonna have to see how it plays out if there's a Logan sized hole left in the rest of their story in the rest of this story I don't think there will be because I think the damage that he has done is inescapable that black cloud is going to be over them for the rest of their lives I think it's going to to dominate every decision they make. I don't think we're going to have moments where, you know, Kendall's seeing visions of Logan, but I think in the back of all of their minds, the criticism that he may have given to them with every move, it's going to be there. Right. I think it's a time where it can stick with them, and I think we'll see, because it happened so quickly and almost like it felt like real time, I don't think we really got to see the kids grapple with this. It was just mo mostly their instant reactions and those different stages of disbelief and, you know, everything that comes along with hearing something as altering, life-altering as your father dying, especially with their deranged relationship. So um, I think we'll definitely see how it truly affects them coming up. Is it something that breaks them free or even shackles them even further? Now, at the end there, is that the first time that they hugged normally? Because they have that weird embrace at the end of season three when they're in Italy, where it's kind of Roman just touching their shoulder. You know, they're all kind of like touching each other, but they're not necessarily hugging. But that was a warm hug where the three of them all got together like, you know, we, we still have each other's backs here. That was a, a touching moment. And it comes from something so devastating, right? These characters are finally able to open up more with each other after their father dies. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, is the conflict going to be solely them three up against everybody else? Or is they're going to start to fracture again and fall into those same habits that we've seen time and time again throughout the series? Well, it's funny with Roman, right? He begins the episode having to fire Jerry. Unintentionally created an adversary. Because now Jerry's not fired, right? Yeah. That never went down the pipes, so she's still in her position. By the way, and Jerry maybe, in that uh, wedding fit? Yeah, maybe she should be CEO. I think I'm... <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. My horse in the race is now gone, because I was Team Logan, so... Team Jerry. I think that's a natural transition. Of course, yeah. That's he's, what Logan would have wanted. <laughs> he's looking up right now like, this is about to be fun. It's about to be some good-ass TV. <laughs> looking up, did they change heaven and hell? Heaven's on the bottom now? I don't think he's making it to heaven. <laughs> but well, like, depending I, on <laughs> I think he's like what good he at, believes, right? You get all, everything's forgiven. You think he... <laughs> I'm sure he's except if anybody Jesus could, Christ is as Lord as Savior <laughs> right, right in the bathroom if anybody that's despicable could get into heaven it would be Logan Roy he would find some sort of loophole like no matter where he goes he's going to the top like, <laughs> yeah, he, no he's chilling he's chilling he's yeah, good yeah. no Satan's gonna be like yo give me some tips I'm a big big fan just make Logan a feudal lord of 
<laughs> Dante's Inferno. But the one moment that really stuck with me, I mean, when Kendall and Roy, uh, when Kendall and Roman first get the phone call and they don't know what to do, they don't know what to say, when Tom's asking for Shiv, and at first they don't go to get Shiv because that shock is really setting in. Right. But that long walk that Kendall takes when the entire wedding just becomes white noise and he's looking for his sister and he can't really find her at first, that to me just felt so real. You're walking in his shoes, being in that sort of situation, where, as I said, where you're in a a setting that's uh, very lively and there's music and people talking, but none of that matters. You have tunnel vision. Sarah Snook's reaction when she's like, is he okay? You know, what's happening? You know, that confusion that she was able to convey, everything about this felt so authentic. So their performances within that setting, it was just the perfect mixture to really just bring that reality to the audience. And the fact that they went there, man, you have to just give them so much credit for it. But the execution from a technical level, acting, the writing, as I said, the writing is still so funny with characters in this state of mind. The fact that they can still nail that comedy. There are so many great lines. As I said, the kids trying to save their father. Uh, The best line is when Tom, when uh, Carrie walks... (laughs) walks in with a reaction and he's like judging by her grin it looks like she caught a foul ball at yank stadium okay. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> yeah they're like come on tom she's in shock cut her some slack <laughs> dude when they somebody asked carl they were like oh should we have kerry re- uh read the statement <laughs> carl goes chuckles the clown <laughs> i think not <laughs> It's small for you know. I think we should get Carrie to do them. Oh, right? now what, you want Carrie to do it? Uh, Chuckles the clown. I think not. <laughs> so everybody just doesn't like Carrie, and that's what Carrie coming to the realization that oh, I don't have my my meal ticket anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a part of this. Even when they have Frank, they tell him that Kendall wants to talk to the pilot, and he just has to like sidestep <laughs> over Logan's dead body. <laughs> but Frank, man, Frank just hates these people at this point. Like Kendall's gonna call me so he could talk to the fucking pilot, and the response he gave them, like he can't talk right now. He's flying the plane, kid. I don't want to bullshit you, Captain. I think he went. I think he's gone. I also like the way that they didn't show Logan. Until right. that very, sh- you know, the shot where we get uh, looking down on his head. That's what made it final for me. Because even though I, <laughs> I knew he was dead, well, but there hear- was just something about it that you just, you just don't know until you see a body. Well, you'll hear, hear stories about people like, oh, they did CPR for five hours and kept him alive. Like, I thought it was going to be one of those situations. Right, right. But at the me end too. of the day, like, well, after a few minutes, you kind of start thinking, like, we already kind of went through this and season one it's the first major conflict that we have in the show so i didn't think they were going to go the route of repeating it so i felt like yeah this is pretty much this is pretty much it for old logie yeah and that one shot did make it seem so final you know that's the last time that we're going to see logan roy on screen and it's just him unresponsive on the floor totally powerless so that's an image that's going to stick with me for a long long time Uh, as i keep saying he was such a larger than life presence uh I think Roman at one time calls him a a planet, you know, and everybody's just in his orbit. And now that's gone. So everything gets scattered. Talk about a power vacuum. So I'm just so excited to see how it plays out. More so for the story, but seeing if the writers are are able to make up for that lack of presence and that lack of conflict. You know, if the old guard versus the new guard is as satisfying as seeing Logan versus the kids. And I think they will nail it because the, the characters that are left over are still such strong characters especially the kids it's going to be i think fascinating to see how this you know either brings them closer or destroys them entirely and i think that's (laughs) that may be the path we're headed down yeah it's even in death bad as logan was he was he was holding things together by the skin of his teeth you know that's the reputation of the company too is that if it without logan this would have fallen apart years ago to go back to my earlier point about logan failing to prepare his kids to succeed him to rule the company in his absence you know if everything blows up in their faces and they're unsuccessful and and pulling together these disparate threads and and weaving a, a new 21st century waystar royco you can say hey that was you know logan's legacy is that he built this company he died and everything fell to shit you know if you could ask him beyond the grave are you satisfied with that conclusion to your legacy i think he would say yeah you know uh, at the end of the day it's my legacy that was the most important part of it was my legacy that was the most important puzzle piece in all of this and now these last seven episodes may play like an epilogue (laughs) you know the inevitable fate that logan has sowed for his children but going back to connor you know his first instinct is to say yeah he never liked me 
So I do think he's, of course he's sad that his father died, but I think there's an element of, man, it had to be today. I can't get one day to celebrate myself. And he's holding out that Logan was never even going to fucking visit the wedding. He was headed straight to Sweden. (laughs) Yeah. And even Roman's like, damn, you're not going to come to Connor's fucking wedding. So it's almost two fuck yous, right? I was never going to come to the wedding. And I also just totally upstaged your day. No one's ever going to be able to think about your wedding without thinking of the old bear. Well, he was Logan till the very end, like right before he gets on that plane, manipulating Roman. (laughs) Screwing over Connor. Are like, you with me? Just fucking Logan Roy to the bitter end. You could tell, like, we've always known Connor was... He, he's not in the same room as Shiv, Kendall, and Roman. I mean, even literally during the sequence, like, he doesn't... They don't even think to get him to talk on the phone and say anything, potential last words to their father. But I do think, in a weird way, like... For Connor, this was, like, a good episode. Like, he obviously is upset that his father died, but, I mean, the biggest thing on his mind is him and his relationship with Willa. And I think as unorthodox their situation is, I think for those two characters to kind of have some type of happy happiness during all this, I think that was actually pretty sweet and nice. Yeah, I guess that's one step closer to I love you. Yeah, I'm with you for the money. That's part of it. But I'm also happy. Yeah. So... At the very least, she likes Connor, and she likes being around him. She likes being with him. Well, even people are, like, so sad that his wedding was only a few people, like, at by the end, because obviously everyone's with Logan. They had to cancel some things, and people had to leave. But I thought that was just nice. It, you know, it's just them two. You know, they don't have to worry about their siblings, their father anymore. He can just focus on, you know, what makes him happy. And Yeah, in a, in a way, it kind of weeds out everybody that actually doesn't care about Connor. Right. Right? Keep the circle smaller. I don't know if you picked up on this, but I think Willa's mom is in love with Connor. <laughs> it is. Like, when they were together, like, you can easily, <laughs> like... I think that should be the couple. That could have been, like, yeah, yeah. they could be a couple, because he is much older than her. Right, right. They just seem more appropriate that his remarks she actually found funny, whereas Willa's just sort of tolerating him at times. So I wonder if that would be a plot twist in the end. Connor runs away with Willa's mom. <laughs> that would be such a Connor move. I-, I think out of all the reactions from the kids, that final shot with Jeremy Strong watching his father being taken away, in, in total disbelief, because it's just so final for him in those moments. And everything that they've been through in their lives and over the course of this show, it's now done. So where do you move on from, you know, (laughs) Kendall's been a character that's always struggled with his identity. And I think a lot of his identity has become getting one over on dad, you know, being able to take down dad and then ascend to his top spot. But now that obstacle is completely out of the way. So there's no more excuses, right? If he feels like he should be top dog, he needs to go and take it. And I think that could be a a bit intimidating for him. So it's a mixture of grieving his father there at the end and realizing the pressures of what comes next. And he, (laughs) I don't know if this is how the kids feel, but he even says to Shiv and Roman, he's like, I know you guys are looking at me for an answer here. (laughs) He's putting that leadership onus on his shoulders already. Uh, Yeah, it's interesting, like, what they're going to do, because depending on how the will works or what gets what, like, if the kids have majority control of Waystar, you know, what do they do? Do they still make the Gojo deal? Do they still want to do a Pierce? Do they say, no, this is our business now. Let's take AV, like, let's take Waystar and let's run it. Yeah, let's reform. It, right? That's worked before. Um, <laughs> when Roman in the preview says he was going to fire everybody in that room, <laughs> uh, he's gone now, so you got to do it, kid. But uh, as I was saying with Roman's guilt, that to me was, uh, as I was saying with Roman's denial, that to me it was not only heartbreaking, but it was a bit disturbing. You just want to take him aside and it's like, it's okay, Roman. It's not your fault. <laughs> Like, give him a shoulder to cry on. And I think that's why it made it so, uh, you know, it was fun to watch because of all the drama. But it, it was hard to watch where I wanted them. I was like, okay, let's let's move on. I don't, I don't like this anymore. I don't like being in this environment <laughs> with all these fucked up emotions. He loves the floor also. He's just he's always on the floor. Straight to the floor whenever he gets devastating news, yeah. yeah. He's such a little kid. <laughs> just got to pick him up by his armpits. Like, come on, bro. <laughs> and it started off so fun with Kendall and Roman when he kidney chops him. Oh, that. the first thing though, like Kendall is so fucking lame. <laughs> he is the lamest, yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, you know what? I would like him as an older brother, you know? I could see yeah, why they no. have a good brother relationship. I, I, yeah. Especially, like, them too. I feel like they've always just had a special bond that, yeah. like, obviously all the stuff they've gone through is, it's not who, what they would want or who they actually are. It's just everything around them and the circumstances that cause that divide. And I think there was a nice moment with Shiv and Kendall with the little handhold, you know? You know, a little subtle, but, like, when we talk about this family and, like you said, that embrace at the end, those aren't common. So when you do see him, it's very impactful. Yeah, even when they're trying to comfort each other when they're on the phone, when Roman takes the phone away from Kendall and he gives him that, he puts his hand on his shoulder. It's so awkward. It's so stiff. So gradually they start to embrace each other more just in this episode. It gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And it sucks that it has to come after something so devastating. But for Roman, I do think it hits him the hardest because of everything he was dealing with up until that moment where he doesn't know if he's going to betray his siblings and go work for his dad. And he doesn't know if his dad is being earnest about this new job job, being the head of ATN, having him do his dirty work. It's the same cycle over over and over again, where, yeah, come with me, be on my side, but first I'm going to need you to do this, and then I'm going to need you to do something else. So Roman is picking up on that scent, and then gone. It's over. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, you know, he was processing so much up until that moment, and now here's a whole new thing that you have to process, death. So that definitely came through his performance in this episode. As good as they all were, I think I, w I was most fascinated by, by Roman's response. And even with Tom, like, his reaction to everything, like, obviously upsetting, shocking, but calls Greg. All right, you gotta, you gotta go to the office. I know, yeah, that motherfucker was moving yeah, already. Shit. Like, he lost, and it comes out, like, he said, like, I lost, like, my safety blanket. So getting on the phone with Greg and, you know, trying to maneuver and set himself up. Dude, the writing between Tom and Greg, it's almost like they're not even a part of the same show. It's like they exist in their own little world. Like when they speak to each what other, do you call no them, one... little Greggies? Little Greggies. <laughs> right. He's like, Tom, I'm a man. I'm not a word. And, and where do you get all these other Greggies? Where'd you get these Greggs? <laughs> or when, uh, you know, <laughs> Tom tells him that, um, he does Logan doesn't want to see Greg because he finds him visually aggravating and then Greg goes I have a little list of nice things I want to say to Carrie Tom's like Greg that's very weird <laughs> their interactions are just so fucking funny dude as I said it's almost like they're speaking their own language that nobody else can hear it's like um like Lion King one and a half type of shit they're just Timon and Pumbaa <laughs> and everybody else is going through the motions and they're just operating on a different wavelength they're so fucking Timon funny and Puma. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right the disgusting brothers. I'm, I'm sure Timon and Pumbaa were getting into some... They, they were city boys. No, they were just gross because they were just eating bugs all the time. Yeah, no, they were just literally disgusting. Yeah. Sure. But as I said, they're just so funny. And you mentioned it, Tom. <laughs> no time to mourn. Got to get the wheels moving here. Got to gotta make your play or set up the pieces to eventually make your play. So that was fun. And he, he, he is such an incredible actor. As I said, trying to keep the kids on a... You know, trying to... Keep the he's, kids calm. He's the last person I would ever want, like, bad news from. <laughs> so Imagine, like, he was your doctor and you, like, have cancer. Him trying to break the news. Like, well, it's not, it's not good, but, you know, there's some positives to take along from this. Um, you, you might have just a little bit of uh, cancer, um, but... There may be a, a sort of cancerous tumor that mm -hmm. is uh, destroying your cells, mm -hmm. but good thing is we can fight it. Not a high success rate, but we can fight it. And we don't even know if it is cancer. No, it could be something could, totally could else. It could be something else. Thanks, Doc. And Greg comes in like, oh, uh, you yeah. tell him about the cancer? <laughs> that's, that's the spinoff. There's so many funny jobs that we could put those two in where Greg is the assistant and Tom's the leading man. You know, Literally anything. They're Mc pilots and McDonald's. the plane's going to crash. Imagine Tom over yeah. the... <laughs> yeah, McDonald's. We got a big order. Or Greg keeps messing up the orders. <laughs> yeah, Tom would be such a dick as a McDonald's manager. Craig would be his little McDonald's piggy. I was thinking it would be, they won't do this, but they should. Like, Kendall just doing a sad acoustic version of L to the OG to eulogize <laughs> his father. I would love that, because he does have a beautiful voice when he sings. It's like, uh, I don't really have the words, uh, so I feel it would be best to do it through song. L to the OG. And he ain't playing. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually going to be really funny, dude, when they do have to go up there and yeah. speak. I wonder if they will give us a, a funeral scene. I'm sure they will. What did they say they're going to do? Reagan? Reagan, <laughs> <Yeah>. Reagan style? <laughs>
I think the ending too, when Shiv has to give that speech, it's hard to pick like who was the best, but I think she continues to like shine, especially in these moments here. I think her reaction to the news was one of the better performances like I've seen from the show at all. Just the subtleties and the tone changes in her voice and cracks and everything. It was super authentic. And at the end, having to deliver that message to the press and she's just almost, you know, you, you say in those moments, like, you, you would assume that you just feel disengaged, almost like you're not even in your own body at that point. I think she like portrayed her not being present in that moment while delivering that news to the press because for her, she didn't go see the body. She didn't see it come off the airplane. Like in a lot of ways, her announcing it to the world made it real. And you can just see how disconnected she is at that moment. And even her embrace with Tom, like she almost forgets for a moment that she hates Tom <laughs> until she does. <laughs> Yeah, and as we said, it is such a risk to kill off a character this early in your season. And there's definitely a shock factor. But it's the way that the events played out, where it wasn't final until those moments where, as you said, Shiv delivers the statement to the press. Kendall's watching the ambulance take away his body. So I think it's going to have a lasting effect. It's not going to be an episode that shocks us in the moment, but what came after it wasn't as good. No, everything great about this episode was the reaction to his death. Mm -hmm. So that's going to leave the lasting impact. That's going to make it where you come back to this episode and you, you can say, hey, these are the best performances that so many of these actors have ever given in this show obviously not with brian cox that probably came maybe in episode two i think a lot of people said that was his best performance uh, of any of the seasons that's why i think it's going to be considered for a long time one of the best episodes not only of the show but uh, of television because uh, it just breaks you down in so many different ways on so many different levels but it's very much still succession so it's like a basically a masterpiece of television yeah it really is i mean even while watching it like you just knew like you were watching something like pretty incredible because it, it was just the way it moved the way it flowed was just so authentic and real like it was a little bit because it happened so early you're kind of like wow we still have like how much time's left in this episode at a certain point like you're not even just time just stops even working because you were just so invested of what was going on on, on screen it could have been two hours it could have been 20 minutes and you really just didn't know the difference until the credits started to roll all right guys that does it for our review of succession season four episode three we are excited to see where the rest of the season is headed man it should be really fun and as i said predicting this show has been you know i'm like oh they're gonna go back and forth with pierce and atn and the election all that stuff and they're no. like nope logan's dead pull the rug out nice restart we will see where this where this game is headed <laughs> Hugo got a tiny ass neck. You ever notice that? <laughs> no, I never did. <laughs> Next time we watch Hugo. Yeah. We're going to keep neck. an eye on that. <laughs> yeah. She got a little neck. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make nerd soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.